Jesus is the ultimate source of strength and sustenance for believers. He promised never to leave or forsake us and that he would provide us with everything that we need to live fruitful and fulfilling lives. In our lesson today, we are studying the first of the seven I am statements where Jesus said, I am the bread of life. I don't know about you, but I'm so glad that through Jesus, we spiritually have sustenance. We spiritually have bread, which gives us access to everlasting life. I'm excited as always. We've got an amazing lesson. Let's see what God has for us. want to take this time and welcome you to another episode of Just Teach. If this is your first time visiting us, I want to extend a very heartfelt welcome to you. If you have any comments, questions, any prayer requests, the comment section is for you. And to everyone watching, we ask that you like and share the video. And if you haven't already, certainly take the time to subscribe to the channel. All of these things go such a long way in helping us spread the message of the gospel all around the world. Now, as always, I want to let you know that notes are available for today's lesson. If you go in the description of the video, you can click and download those. They're absolutely free and you can follow along as we go through the lesson. I highly encourage you to download the notes <laughs> because I always like to tell people that there are things that I just don't get to in the notes for whatever reason. Sometimes things slip my mind uh, and sometimes I'm cutting things out because I'm trying to keep the video reasonably concise, you know, even though people may not believe that. <laughs> but yeah, I try not to make the videos too long. So sometimes I cut things out. I encourage you to download the notes. Again, they're free. I, I certainly pray that they're just an blessing and encouragement to your studies. So um, also want to let everyone know that we are almost in one year of Just Teach Ministries. It's almost our first anniversary. I, I cannot believe that a year has gone by like this. This has gone by, it's, it's gone by quick for me. I don't know what it's been for you, but for me, it, it felt like an overnight thing, you know. Um, but either way it goes, I want to celebrate with you guys. There are some things that I, I want to do so that we can kind of celebrate. And even though it is Just Teach's anniversary, you guys are getting the prizes. So be on the lookout for those. I'm looking forward to some exciting engagement and just having a good time with you guys. So we are continuing in the spring quarter of the Union Gospel Press Sunday School book. The theme for the spring quarter is Jesus Pleases the Father. We, we have been studying different things that took place in the life and ministry of Jesus, things that Jesus did that brought glory to the Father. So, of course, Jesus' baptism in, in the wilderness and then him doing different teachings and different things like that. Certainly uh, the, uh, the crucifixion, of course, the resurrection and ascension. We've been studying so many different elements of Jesus' life. For the remainder of this unit or quarter, if you will, we're pretty much going to be diving into the I am statements. Uh, we're not going to get into all seven of them, but we're going to get into, I think, five of them. So uh, such an exciting uh, just concept to study with these I am statements. So we're going to start off with the first I am statement, which is the I am the bread of life. That's actually the title of today's lesson, the bread of life. And we're coming out of John chapter six. We're going to be in verses 22 through 35. So someone might, might ask right off the top, they might ask, well, what what is the I am statements or what is what is the significance of the I am statements? And why, why would Jesus take the time to say this stuff during his ministry? And that is a phenomenal question. And of course, to go to the answer to that, we have to go back to Exodus chapter three. It was in Exodus that when God was having a conversation with Moses and he was giving Moses the instruction and the directive, he's saying, I'm sending you to Egypt to talk to Pharaoh and to tell him to let my people go. He was like, tell Pharaoh, you need to release the children of Israel out of captivity, out of slavery. And of course, Moses is having this, this back and forth dialogue with God. He's saying things like, who am I to go to Pharaoh? You know what I'm saying? And then he's saying like, if I go to the children of Israel, who should I say sent me? Like what, who's the God of their fathers? Like he's saying like, what name can I call out that they would readily identify so that they would actually listen to me? Like he's trying to give God so many excuses and God comes to him and says, tell them I am that I am has sent you. So in Exodus chapter three, verse 14, this is God responding to Moses. He said, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, 
Israel, I am has sent me unto you. That is such a powerful statement. God is saying, I'm not restricting myself to, to one definition. I'm not restricting myself to one line of understanding. Like whatever there is a God of, God of creation, the God of healing, the God of the sun, whatever it is, the God of your provisions, he's saying whatever it is, I am God. I am that I am. Such a powerful statement. So of course, throughout uh, biblical history in Judaism, this became the, the name of God. I am. So when Jesus is teaching over his over his ministry and over his life, of course, he didn't just come to die. He, he has to help them understand that he is the son of God as prophesied in Daniel. He has to help them understand that he's the Messiah and the Christ. And the way that he's doing that through his teachings is he's giving these I am statements. And he's he's not just giving the seven I am statements. I mean, even at one point, I think it was in John chapter 11, when Jesus made the statement, he said before Abraham was I am. And and, and of course, the Jewish leaders that were listening at that time, Scripture says they, they they sought to stone him, you know, because they knew that he was he knew that he was calling himself God. He was calling himself the Son of God. So that was so important, and that's why Jesus is is making statements like what we're getting ready to study in John chapter six. So, what's important for you to know? Leading up to John six and twenty two is that earlier in this chapter, Jesus had just done the feeding of the five thousand, the two fish and the five barley loaves. So because Jesus had performed this 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 miracle of multiplication, if you will, because Jesus had just done this this mighty act, Scripture says that Israel sought to make him a king. Now, we, <laughs> there's such a dynamic going on here because these people are following Jesus because they recognize his power, but what's tragic is they're not recognizing him as a son of God. And that's what we're gonna get into this lesson. They're chasing his hand, they're not chasing his heart. And that's the problem because they're under this Roman occupation. They're 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 under this Roman, you know, captivity, if you will, not quite as bad as Egypt, but still, you know, they're not completely free. And they're waiting for a king. They're, they're waiting for somebody whose throne will be established forever. They're, they're ready for somebody who's like a military juggernaut who can overthrow this, this Roman oppression. If you look in John chapter 6, verse 15, it says, when Jesus therefore perceived that they would come and take him by force. They they were going to make him be king. They were like, "Look man, we need you. We need you to we need you to be king. Get it get in there." And it says to make him a king, it says he departed again into the mountain uh himself alone. So so what happened is after Jesus fed the 5,000 and the disciples collected the 12 baskets and they were trying to throng him and make him king, Jesus sent the disciples to the other side. So they were in Bethsaida and he sent them across the Sea of Galilee. Galilee to the city of Capernaum and uh, Jesus went into the mountains to pray. So they saw that. They witnessed the disciples getting in the boat, going to the other side, Jesus leaving. Okay. So uh, what they don't see is that night Jesus walks on the water. Yeah, that that little event happened, right? <laughs> they didn't see that. So Jesus walks across the water uh, and then, of course, has the exchange with Peter and Peter tries to walk on water and all that stuff. And then they 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 sail and they make their way completely to, to Capernaum. So what where we're at now in John 6 and 22 is the next day. The next day they're looking for Jesus and they're like, let's do it again. So let's let's pick up in John 6 and 22 and let's begin to unpack. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save that one where into the disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone. Howbeit there came boats from Tiberias nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, when camest thou hither? I really want you to look at the tenacity of these Galileans, of these people that are, that are looking for Jesus. This, this is a crowd, because understand, we're talking about that Jesus 
earlier in John chapter six, fed the 5,000. And we know that it was just 5,000 men. So if you add the women, the children, you know, some commentators, some theologians estimate 15, 20, 20,000 plus people that are on this just mass movement trying to find Jesus. I want you to see this because this is this is showing us a few things. You know, this this is showing us the the draw that Jesus's ministry has at this point, but it's also just showing us the draw of ministry in general, which I, I want I want to put a pin there because we need to come back to that. But what is happening right now? Again, they were in Bethsaida when uh Jesus did the feeding of the 5000. They crossed they uh the disciples and Jesus crossed the sea of Galilee, Tiberius, whatever you want to call it, went to Capernaum. So these people showed up, didn't find him. Essentially, between verses 22 and 23, what you're seeing is that some boats likely kind of blew in from the Sea of Tiberius. When it says in verse number 23, it says other boats from Tiberius. It means literally the sea. It's saying that like maybe they just washed ashore and that they use that to cross the Sea of Tiberius to where I want you to look at the effort <laughs> that they're putting in to try to get in Jesus's proximity. And then verse 24 says something. It says they came seeking Jesus. But I want to I want to stir that a little bit because it is an illegitimate seeking. They are not authentically seeking Jesus. They're, they do. It, we don't always think about it as believers, but there is such thing as a right way and a wrong way to seek God, you know, and, and I, I'm taking the time to say this because we see this in modern church. We, we see this in because if you're a Sunday school teacher and you put out Facebook somewhere, hey, I got a Sunday school class. Come come check out my Sunday school class. How many people going to show up? I don't know handful maybe maybe you're part of part of a larger church maybe maybe a larger but but think about if you said we've got a prophetic summit and we're going to have this dynamic prophet who's going to who's going to speak into your life and they're going to say something really amazing that you've never heard before how many people show up to that and see i want you to understand is that that same entertainment draw that prophetic conferences have is the same draw that Jesus was having at this time because they witnessed a miracle, but they weren't really even appreciative of the fact that God was demonstrating signs in front of them. All that they were that they were drawn to is the natural benefit of the miracles. And we got to be careful about that as believers, as modern day believers, we have to be careful about being drawn to only the natural benefits of the signs, the wonders, the powers and the demonstrations of God that it, it is not exclusively for natural benefit. And oftentimes it's really for a spiritual purpose. And we miss God by by tunnel vision, only wanting God to do something to satisfy our flesh. So here we have it. They're seeking God. They're seeking Jesus, but not really. Because when you seek Jesus, when you think about that, it, it, you think about like devotion. You, you, you think about spending time in the word. You know, you, you think about trying to grow in the knowledge and the wisdom that that seeking God. They weren't doing this. I want to quote Augustine real quick. St. Augustine said, it says, for thou has formed us. For thyself, this is Augustine speaking of God. He said, thou has formed us for thyself and our hearts are restless till they find their rest in thee. What's interesting and, and can be dangerous sometimes about the move of God is that it does tap into the longing that's on the inside of us. We're never satisfied as human beings until we come into authentic connection with God. You can have all the money in the world. You can have all the power, fame, everything that this natural life can offer. And then you can even encounter some of the natural uh, benefits of, of a church setting. 
you will never be satisfied until you come into a true relationship with God. And that you have to push past all of this entertainment. You got to push past all of this fluff and get into an authentic relationship with God. You know, when, when we talk about seeking God and I'm getting ready to get into some things that are that are hindrances of seeking God. But one of the one of the theological concepts that I want to throw out to you is this thing called prevenient grace, Pre prevenient grace. By definition, it is it is the grace of God in a person's life, which precedes and prepares them for conversion. And when we talk about conversion, we talk about you giving your life to the Lord, turning from your old man to your new man in Christ. Second Corinthians 5 and 17, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things pass away. All things become new. Conversion. So when we talk about prevenient grace, we're talking about the grace that's on your life before you give your life to the Lord, and it says before a man can seek God, he must have first, God must first have sought the man. Before a man can seek God, God must first have sought the man. And that's why I'm bringing this up, because when we talk about seeking the Lord, the scripture says, by my loving kindness have I drawn thee. You know, you can only seek God if God has sought you. You, you can only seek God if God has put the right ministry in front of you in order to cultivate an authentic appetite for the things of God. And what we call that is we call that the prevenient grace of God. It is the, it is the grace of God on your life before you get saved. You know, so many people can testify about how, my goodness, they were in so many dangerous situations before they gave their life to the Lord. So many, so many near death situations. Some people can testify and be like, man, I was in the club and bullets were just flying by my head and somehow I didn't get shot. People can say, man, I used to do drugs and there were people next to me overdosing and somehow they overdosed, but I lived. You know, there are there are people that say like people in my family went through this tragic experience, but somehow God kept me. It is there was a great grace on your life before you even got saved. And then when you get saved, when you are converted, you go back sometimes and look over your life and you're like, man, God, God has been operating all this time. So I, I, as we talk about seeking God and we're making our way through this, I wanted to take my time with this because listen, you, you cannot appreciate that Jesus is the bread of life. If you don't understand how to properly seek God, you will not be satisfied with bread unless you understand what the bread represents. I, I, I want somebody to get that because as we're making our way into that, you know, if somebody were to just put a table full of bread in front of you in in modern terms, people would look at that and be like, <laughs> what is this? They'd be like, where's the steak? You know, where are the ribs? Where are the sides, you know what I'm saying? And all this, are you just going to give me bread? Like bread is like the, the, you know, I can live without bread. That's, that's what we think today. But if you understood from a spiritual standpoint, what bread represented, you would understand, oh no, I can't, I can't live without bread. I got to bring you to that place. So before we get to a, a place of appreciating bread, you got to understand what can hinder it, what can hinder you seeking God. Number one. I'm going to give you three things. Number one, personal problems. I, I, this may sound brash. This, this may sound, you know, very stern, but I'm, I want you to understand something. When it comes to your walk with God, when it comes to you serving God, when it comes to, to matters of the kingdom, it's not about you. It, you, you, when you, when you authentically seek God, you literally have to put yourself in your own personal desires on the back burner in order for you to effectively seek God. It is, it is, it is the concept of emptying yourself out. And we actually study this through the life of Jesus. There is something called the theory of kenosis that is, that is personified in Philippians chapter two. Let me read it real quick. Philippians chapter two, verse seven, it says that Jesus, it says, but made himself of no reputation. This is Jesus. God being equal with God thought it not robbery made himself of no reputation, took on the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of man. So he reduced himself, he denied himself, he emptied himself in order for him to be in the proper place in order to fulfill the call of God on his life. So when we talk about seeking God, 
one of your hindrances is personal problems. You know, some people get so caught up in things like, mm, that person's looking at me funny. And like, mm, I'm not being treated right. And mm, I feel like I should be given this. Listen, deny yourself because it's about the kingdom. Second thing I want to put out, material things. This is a big one because for some reason in modern church, we have reduced God to materialism. You listen to so much preaching today and it seems like the only reason we get saved is to get a big house, money in the bank, fancy car, get married and just have some amazing natural. Listen, that's that that is peripheral stuff. Now, all that stuff is on the ancillary. Matthew 6 and 33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Let's let's just stop right there. So when we talk about you, 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 you cannot come to God on the lens of seeking him for natural benefit. That's when you're like this crowd and you are not authentically seeking God. That is an illegitimate seek and that is a hindrance. Number three, and I'm out of here, half-hearted seeking. Now you see, some of y'all thought that I missed you, but I got you right there. Because some people are like, sometimes I feel like a nut and sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm on fire for God and sometimes I'm on water for God. Sometimes you're not on fire. So some days that fast life is clicking, your prayer life is on point, your, 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 your study life, you're, you're consistent. And then sometimes you turn around and look back over the past couple of weeks, the past couple of months, and you're like, man, when's the last time I've been in my word? It's a half-hearted seek. And I want you to understand that you are going to miss so much in God until you become consistent in God. Jeremiah 29 and 13, it says, and ye shall seek me and find me when you have searched for me with your whole heart. So let me give it to you as we make our way to the next verses. How do you seek God wholeheartedly and not half-heartedly? I want to tell you, you have to get busy serving God. You have to get busy doing something for the kingdom. The only way that you're going to be consistent in God if you have, is when you have responsibility. See, some of y'all are parents and you will understand you never got yourself together financially until you had kids. You're like, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> it, it's not just me anymore. I've got responsibility. Some of us would never manage our schedules unless we had the responsibility of caring for loved ones or we had some big responsibility that placed that burden on us and we're like, you know what? I've got to get myself together or else my whole world's gonna fall apart. It's the same way in ministry. Busy yourself in the kingdom of God. Busy yourself doing the things of God and when you realize that you have to be available at a moment's notice in order to serve God, you'll be consistent in the things of God. Let's get to the next verses and let's see how the story continues. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me, not because ye saw the miracles, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him hath God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do, that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him whom he hath sent. Once the crowd, the Galileans, make it to the other side, they, they find Jesus and they like immediately just ask you like, hey man, where are you? You know, what's funny is that Jesus, they just proposed one question to Jesus, like where, where were you? Where did you go? And he's immediately able to read their motives. I want you to get that. He, he immediately knew why they were looking for him. And he, and he called it out. He addressed it straight up. And, and we have to take a page out of this as believers. We have to know that God understands our heart. We may do things, and on the surface, it may look a certain way, but God knows our hearts. It says the heart of man is desperately wicked. It says, who can know it? But the scripture does also tell us that God knows the heart of man. So this is what we're seeing right here, is that in verse number 26, Jesus says, ye seek me 
Not because you saw miracles, not because you witnessed the move of God, not because you're grateful to see that God is demonstrating his power through signs and wonders. You're, you're not you're not seeking him for that. He says, you seek me because you ate the loaves and you were filled. In other words, he said, I did something that just happened to satisfy your flesh and you're looking for me to do it over again. How many times have we seen people do that in church? How many times have we seen people come to church and engage in, in in what's supposed to be spiritual, you know, activities, but they only want it for natural reasons. You only come to church because you're looking for a husband. You, you you only come to church because it's cheap entertainment. You 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 just come to church because there's somebody there that's helping you out financially, and you just want to make an effort and show up. You, you're there for the lows. <laughs> but you're not there for the miracles. You're, you're not there for God. And he and he's calling it out. So Jesus says in verse number 27, he immediately goes into a teaching dialogue and says, labor not for the meat which perisheth. Now, I want to put a pin right here because Jesus is not saying we should not desire any type of secular accomplishment. He's, he's not telling you to live your whole life strictly on a spiritual plane and that you should not desire. Scripture says, if you delight yourself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. What Jesus is asking them to do in verse number 20, 27 is he's saying, prioritize God. That's, that's, that is the message right here. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. It says for him, okay. Before we get into the seal, we have to understand that the only way that we know as human humans that there's such thing as everlasting anything, everlasting life, everlasting God, everlasting meat, you know what I'm saying? The only way that we know this is through the word of God. So it's, it's only through the word of God that we are able to, first of all, put our lives in proper priority and proper alignment. It's only through the word of God that we're able to direct our appetites and, and to come into concepts where it says things like set your affections on things that are above. If you have no concept of God, if you have no biblical reference or no scripture framework for that type of, of knowledge, not just philosophy, but theology, if scripture is not feeding that motive, then you don't know to seek for something that's everlasting. This is what Jesus is trying to do right here. He's trying to turn their hearts in the right direction. But he want, I want you to understand there's nothing wrong with them having meat. Just prioritize God. So then he says something very interesting at the end of verse number 27. It says, for him have God. It says, uh, yeah, God the Father sealed. Uh, a seal in biblical times was like the form of an official signature. It was something that was often done with like a signet ring or something like that. It is just like, boom. It's like, it makes it official. It makes it authentic. So when you talk about seal by definition, it means to confirm, authenticate, authenticate excuse me, or to place beyond doubt. When, when you see the seal on something, you know, when you read about in Luke chapter 15, when the prodigal son came home and it says that the father gave him a robe, uh, shoes, and it gave him a ring. It was a signet ring. It was, he was saying, hey, look, he can sign officially on my behalf. This is, this is what, this is what Jesus is saying right here. It says that God has authenticated and removed any doubt who the son of man is. He's saying, that's me. So he keeps going. This is good. I hope it's blessing you. Verse 28. So they asked him a question. You, 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 you would think on the surface by looking at this that they're getting spiritual all of a sudden and like, oh, maybe they're understanding. No, they're not understanding, you know, because they're immediately asking, how can we work the works of God? Again, the frame of this crowd, though they are Galilean, they are Jewish in ethnicity. We're talking about people that are coming from a Judeo faith influence. And of course, Judaism is a works-based faith. You earn your way into heaven. If you do the right thing, then you go to heaven. But so, the, and, and we see this 
throughout scripture. Uh, oftentimes when Jesus has conversations with different people, they immediately turn and ask Jesus, like, what can I do to, to earn this thing that you're offering me? Uh, the woman at the well, it says, uh, Jesus said, if thou knewest the gift of God. He, he immediately told her, he's like, you don't even understand. He says, I asked you for water. But he said, if you knew who I was, you would ask me for water. You would, if y'all knew the gifts of God, you would ask water of me. She didn't get it. Rich young ruler. When Jesus told him, you know, uh, what he needed, he came, he came to Jesus asking, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Mm. The Philippian jailer. Again, what must I do in order to be saved? Now we understand as Christians that you don't do, but you receive salvation. Why? Because it's a gift. Amen. Ephesians chapter two, verse eight, it says, for by grace are ye saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, lest any man should boast. That's that's funny. That, that's 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 funny that that Paul has to qualify it like that. He said, you know, if y'all earned your way into heaven, you would start bragging on yourself and you wouldn't understand that this is God's provision. That is your salvation. So here we are. He's he's. They're asking a question, how can they earn their way into heaven? And Jesus is immediately beginning to, to minister to that understanding. And he says, this is the work of God. He said, believe. He says, believe on him whom he has sent. So in other words, he's saying, believe on me, the son of God, who the father has sent. By definition, the word believe, because we got to understand this. All believe is not created equal. There's a lot of people running out there saying, I believe in God, but, but their belief looks different than, than my belief. Their, their belief looks different than some other people's beliefs. So when you talk about belief, first of all, it is the conviction. Okay, there it is. The conviction and trust to which a man is impelled by a certain inner and higher prerogative in the law of the soul. It is a conviction that a man is compelled on the inside to live in a higher prerogative. When you talk about believe, what it literally says is that there is no difference between what you believe and what you do. If you say you believe in God, if you say you believe in the word, then you do the word. Because if you don't do the word, then you don't really believe, do you? This is, this is what he's saying. So when he's saying believe on him, listen, I'm not walking back my previous statement, please don't think I'm telling you that you earn salvation. It's still the gift of God. All Jesus is saying is that if you really do believe, or if you are authentically seeking me, hmm, this bread of life, he said, if you're seeking me and you're not being hindered in your walk, your lifestyle would line up with your conversation, with your conviction, with your confession. In John chapter five, verse 24, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believe on him that hath sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death to life. It's, he's giving you the promise. I, I don't know about you, but I appreciate God so much that he, that he so often ties promises to his instructions. He just doesn't just tell us to do things, but he gives us promises. And right here, he's saying, if you believe, then you get everlasting life and you don't come into condemnation. Blesses the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight shall be in the law of the Lord, and therein doth he meditate both day and night. Verse 3, give me the promise, but he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of living water that bringeth forth his fruit in due season, neither shall his leave wither. Whatsoever he do shall prosper. There's promises tied to obedience. There's promises tied to believing in God. So he's, he's, he's healing their understanding. He's already turning them from, from this posture of just wanting something natural from God and then from this works-based faith to say, just believe and receive he still got some work to do. Let's get into the next verses. They said, therefore, unto him, what sign showest thou then that we may see and believe thee? What dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, 
Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life unto the world. Now that Jesus uh, is having this spiritual conversation with them, and he's having this, this dialogue where he's instructing them in the word of God to believe on him who God has sent so that they can have everlasting life, they... The wheels are turning at this point. He hasn't made the I am statement yet, but they're they're hearing that he is leading down a path where he's referring to himself as a son of God. They're, they're, they're seeing this and they're like, OK, now, if you're going to be the Messiah, if you're going to be the fulfillment, they're saying, give us a sign, you know, and mm, you can't 100 percent fault them for it. I mean, you can because this is Jesus, but. And he did just work a miracle of the, you know, the 5,000, two fish, five barley loaves. But um, they're asking for a sign because that is very customary uh, for the Jewish faith. And then, I mean, scripture even opens up in Genesis, in the Torah, it opens up in Genesis with the creation, with, you know, saying things like God created light as a sign, you know, for the seasons and the times and the days and different things like that. So, I mean, it's, it's something that was, has been intrinsic. In, in, in their belief system from the beginning. But so they're asking for a sign. They're like, give me proof. A sign by definition, it is an unusual occurrence. It is something that is transcending the common course of nature. In other words, it's saying do the supernatural. It's saying do something to demonstrate that you are something greater than nature. You know, uh, there are several signs given to us in scripture. I already mentioned one, light rainbows. Um, Jesus is a sign. Uh, the Holy Spirit. Hey, that's a, that's, that's a good one. The Holy Spirit is a sign or at least tongues. Tongues are a sign. There we go. That's what I wanted to bring out. Tongues, sign of the Holy Spirit. Interesting sign, not purpose, but a sign. Yes. So here we are he, they're, they're asking for a sign. They're getting real spiritual, just like the woman at the well, you know? I mean, Jesus starts telling her all her business, and all of a sudden, Jesus, I perceive you are a prophet. I was like, oh, we're spiritual now. Um, so they're, they're having, they're all of a sudden, they're, they're spiritual, and so they get real specific with the sign, and they say, well, Moses gave us manna. He says, our fathers did eat manna in the desert. It says, he gave them bread from heaven, he being Moses. Now, manna, by definition, means what is this? Now, we know what manna was. Manna is when they were traveling in the wilderness and they didn't have any food. And <laughs> I wish I had time to deal with this. Uh, they didn't have any food and God began to provide manna uh, uh, for them and gave them instructions. But he, gave, he sent the instructions through Moses and they make... Uh, a, a theological error right here and they say that Moses provided the manna and they they begin to do this comparison and say well Moses fed the children of Israel for 40 years they're like you only fed us once so they're saying that the, you need to do something greater than Moses in order to prove because Moses is not the son of God Moses is not the Christ, the Messiah. So it's like if Moses has done something that we perceive in our minds is greater than what you just did, you still got some got some work to do, Jesus. You still got to prove yourself. So Jesus continues in the conversation in verse number 32, and he corrects the theology. He says, Moses gave you not bread from heaven. Don't, don't, don't mistake in this. He said, but my father giveth you true bread from heaven. He's, he's telling them... <laughs> <laughs> he's telling them that the blessing came from God. I wish I had time to talk about how so often believers misconstrue the vessel from God. They misconstrue the gift from the gift giver. And so many times as believers, as churchgoers, we tend to honor the vessel that God is using as God. Hmm. That's that's what they were doing with Moses right there. They were putting Moses in God's place and they were saying Moses provided for us. And Jesus is like, hold on. It wasn't Moses. It was God. It was God operating through Moses. Got to take a page out of that. It, 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 this this Galilean crowd is showing us so many of the critical mistakes that as 
believers, as as modern believers that people are still making making to this day. You know, just seeking God for you know the the natural blessings versus seeking Him for for the God that He is. You know, just chasing after Him and not not seeking Him legitimately. You know, in in putting people on a pedestal when only God is the one that deserves the glory. So then, finally, in verse number 30, uh, 33, uh, it says, "For the bread of God which cometh down from heaven." I want to say, hold on, go back to thirty two. True bread. True by definition, it's that which uh, has not only a name and semblance, but is real nature correspondence. I, I wanted to bring this up because anytime you talk about true, that means that there's a false. I want you to hear that. If there is a true Christ, there's a false Christ, an antichrist. If there are true preachers, there are false preachers, true teachers, false teachers, true prophets, false prophets. And he's saying that there's true bread. So you got to know that there's a false bread out there. Got to give this to somebody because you have to be careful that everybody that holds a mic and stands in a pulpit is not giving you true bread. They might be giving you some false bread. They might be giving you something that looks like it came from God. They might be giving you something that seems like it was elevated from the praises of the scripture. But the problem is, is that it does not lead to everlasting life. And if you believe in the false bread that you're given, scripture says any man that believeth a lie is damned. I want to give that to you. You got to be careful that you get the true bread because it's only the true bread that's going to lead unto everlasting life. So then in verse 33, it says, for the bread of God, which cometh down from heaven, it says it giveth life unto the world. Jesus is for everybody. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever. Jesus is for everybody. So he is the life. He is what gives life to the whole world. Let's get to the last two verses and let's close out the lesson. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth on me shall never thirst. The crowd in verse 34, uh, still thinking in natural planes you know they're thinking like you can give us bread that lasts forever and that produces everlasting life they're like they're like yeah I'm, I'm all game for it again they're thinking about maybe the manna that god sent to them when they're in the wilderness they're looking for natural bread that's going to do something amazing they're saying hey give us this bread and then jesus has to again heal their understanding and say i am the bread I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me says never hunger and he that believeth on me never thirst again. It's very reminiscent again of uh, the woman at the well. You know, very interesting how these those two conversations kind of overlap with this one in John 14, John 4 and 14. Uh, Jesus said, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. This is talking about the satisfaction that, that we have in, in God and how he is the fulfillment of everything that we need and want. That That is amazing. Sometimes you don't even know that you need certain things, but people that know you better than you know yourself, a God that knows you better than you know yourself because he created you, can give you exactly what you need. So let's talk about this real quick. Two things I want to talk about with this. Again, seven I am statements. If you downloaded the notes, you're looking at the seven I am statements. This is what Jesus has made throughout his ministry. The first one is I'm the bread of life. I'm the light of the world. I am the door, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth and the life. <laughs> and then in John 15, he says, I am the true vine. So he's going to go on and he's because talking to different audiences, and again, trying to help their understanding that he is the son of man, that he is God in flesh. He's having to, to have these different I am statements. Bread in biblical times, when Jesus, why would Jesus call himself bread out of all things that he could have called himself? I don't know in, in modern terms if we would refer to himself as bread, because bread doesn't mean the same thing in 2023 than it meant in biblical times, right? So when, when, when you look at Bread in biblical times, they would almost live off a bread diet. It was almost like rice is today. You know what I'm saying? He's, he's essentially saying like it's it's a staple and 
essential for life. And that's what when Jesus is saying that I am the bread of life. He's saying I'm essential. You cannot live without me and you will get all that you need in me. Number two, he's saying that bread is for everyone. There, there's no one. There wasn't gluten people back in the day. There, there wasn't people that like, oh, I'm watching my carbs. You know, what? there wasn't any of that back in biblical times. If you didn't eat bread, you struggled. So everybody ate bread. Number three, it was eaten daily. Give us this day, our daily bread. So Jesus is, is saying, essentially, when he's calling himself bread, he's saying, you need me every day. You cannot live without me. If you go a day without me, you're going to be malnourished. You're going to be in trouble. This is what Jesus is saying. You know, sometimes people think that, oh, I can skip a day doing this. I can skip a day prayer. I can skip a day devotion. No, daily. He's saying, consume me daily. And finally, I want to point out that bread is something that produces growth on the inside of you. It is something that you need to help into your navel, marrow into your bones. So I, 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 this is such a beautiful passage of scripture. I've got to wrap it up because this video is getting super long, you know, but I just want to point out that as John 6 goes on, you know, uh, Jesus starts to say things like, you know, if any man come after me, he must eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. Understand the full spectrum as what has just taken place. Jesus performed a miracle early in the chapter and he's got this huge following, but it's not legitimate following. following. So he has to preach discipleship to them. He has to back up, you know, sound theological teaching to the miracle because if he just did miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle and he never taught sound teaching he would have this huge following of illegitimate seekers i hope somebody is picking up what i'm putting down i hope you understand what i'm saying you cannot give this fluffy church experience and give this you know uh miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle and never counterbalance that with sound theological teaching because what you do is when you teach theology when you teach discipleship when you teach the cost of the life is you begin to not only mature people but you begin to weed out those who are not authentically connected and it's better to weed them out so that they understand where they really stand with God. See, when Jesus started teaching about discipleship and drinking of his uh, drinking of his uh, blood and eating of his flesh, Scripture says that some left and never followed him anymore. And that's what a real minister has to do. You got to preach the whole counsel of God. Everybody's not going to like it. You, you're, you're not going to have always a mass following. Sometimes your following is going to ebb and flow. Because depending on what you say, that tickles their fancy. But you can't just do miracle after miracle after miracle. You have to preach discipleship. And that's what he's doing. And he opened it up with this I am statement. I am the bread of life. Listen, that's our lesson for today. I trust and pray that something was said. Hopefully that encouraged you. That strengthened your understanding of God's word. As always, listen, if you came to the conclusion over the course of this video that maybe you want to take part in this bread of life. Maybe you're saying I need to give my life to the Lord. Maybe you're saying that I need to get things right with God. Listen, if you want somebody to walk you through the prayer of faith, there is a prayer line in the description of this video. You can call that prayer line and somebody is waiting to talk with you and walk you through that process. And if there happens to be anybody that's got a need, listen, God is a prayer hearing and a prayer answering God. Listen, that line is for you as well. We're here to touch and agree with you and to believe God for whatever you're believing God for, because we certainly want God to do great things in your life. Listen, to everybody else, we love you with the love of the Lord. We'll see you next time. Perhaps you'd like to be a financial support to Just Teach Ministries. There are two ways that you can give through Cash App at dollar sign C O D W C or through Super Thanks, which is located in the ribbon of buttons just below this video. And remember, any amount you give is greatly appreciated.